you took it and ran. So, I mean, um, you, you basically, I, I didn't need to give you much direction because, um, what was that? You, you nailed the accent for all the characters um, very well. The hovel door banged open behind them. Bring back something for us, will ya? Barnaby shouted. And some slugs, Bigsby added as he staggered out with his twin. They love to come out in the rain. Ivor pretended not to hear. He didn't want to touch any slugs. If you're going near the fairy bridge, then don't forget to greet the fairies, Aunt Myra called out, surprisingly. You're always supposed to greet them. They become quite cross if you don't. And it's uh, finally nice to actually speak with you one-on-one -on -one rather than through emails. Yeah, this is not only the first time we've seen each other, it is the first time we've communicated verbally, which is kind of weird considering we've done an audio book together and you would think, you know, with the feedback, the way it has to go back and forth, that would be the easiest way, but it always tends out to, to be with the, with the ACX messaging system because everything's written down. I, um, I kind of like it. Not that I've got any problem with I, that I have other authors who, who ring me quite a lot during an audio book, and that's fine. That's just the way they work. Yeah. yeah and I apologize. I gave you limited information um, because uh, I think starting out, I mean, I'm, I'm always overwhelmed with things. So, um, and this audio book was one of them. Um, just, it's just one of many things I do. So like, uh, and you took it, you took it and ran. So, I mean, um, you, you basically... I, I didn't need to give you much direction because, um, what was that? You, you nailed the accent for all the characters, um, very well. I mean, and that was, that was a big thing. Um, I, I take it you're from like, um, uh, like, are you from like Liverpool or Manchester area? Wow. Wow. That is good. How did you work that out? Well, I've been to Liverpool quite a few times and I, I usually fly into Manchester. So I live in, um, I stay about half the year in Isle of Man, so I have to take the I have to go to the ferry uh, terminal from Liverpool. Yeah. So what I usually do is fly into Manchester, stay in Liverpool a few days, do some shopping. Um, I believe you call it the O2 area, or the the main area, uh, or not the O2. Um, the um, Liverpool the main area One. Oh, what's that? Liverpool One. Liverpool One. That's it. That's it. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I, I sorry. O2 is where I get my phone in, uh, <laughs> in that area. So, um, so where so are my, you, Elman? Whereabouts in in the in, in, in the, the United Panhandle, uh, Panhandle, Florida, uh, which okay. is uh, right. So if Alabama took a shit, that's us. Um, <laughs> and whereabouts? I've been to Florida. Whereabouts in Florida? Um, it's it's near Pensacola. Um, it's a yeah. panhandle, it's the n northwest part of Florida. Um, we're basically if you if you come here, most people are kind of surprised. Uh, it's more like Alabama. Most of the teams are like Alabama. Um, we have like uh, you know this the city. It, it's a very very I guess like this part of the southern states. Uh, it's more like that than it is like what people think of Orlando or Miami or such. Right. Okay. And did you did you grow up there? Are you from there? Yeah, I grew up. Uh, um, we my dad was a pilot, so we lived all over. So my my brother was born in Canada, um, but he he ended up moving here before he crashed. Um, you know, he crashed and died when I was three and a half. But um, but I'm yeah, sorry he. To hear uh, that. Oh, it's. I mean, it's uh, it's it's about um almost forty years ago now, so um. But, uh, yeah, we we just ended up staying here. I spent l a good part of my 20s, though, living abroad. I mean, I lived in Switzerland. Um, I've uh, lived in Japan as an English teacher. And then I've also uh, done some schooling in uh, Ireland in Cork. So, so but... Well, that's a great background for an author who writes books set on the Isle of Man. Because the Isle of Man is a bit of a melting pot and well done spotting where I'm from. I was born in Liverpool and I grew up in Great Sankey, which is just outside Warrington. And Warrington's halfway between Liverpool and Manchester. So you nailed it, which is really, really good because I did spend from the age of 18 to the age of, what was I, like 33 or something? I spent outside the UK. I was in New Zealand and Australia. So my accent has got... 
a bit messed up, but you still you still found it in there. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're still you're you're a bit clearer than <laughs> let's just say your average uh, person, or you know, I mean, even well, the Mancunian accent's a bit easier to for me to listen to, but I, and I actually it took me a while to get used to Liverpool. I mean, I remember asking someone for directions to a shop, and um, he was really thick. And I felt so proud of myself when I understood him and, and went the right way. I was like, man, because uh, most people, even most people around said that they're very difficult to understand. But um, I mean, I got quite used to it. Um, so it's not so bad for me anymore. But you've been but, in Ireland for a while, hadn't you? So there's a bit of Irish in the Liverpool accent. There's a lot of Irish and a lot of Welsh, which is why you get a lot of static because of the Welsh have that thing as part of their language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't they say like um, instead of here they say here or something like that? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the word the word the word to for, for Liverpool to tell is the word chicken because in Liverpool it's chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I haven't heard anyone say that there, but okay. um, <laughs> right. but, um, but then again, I mean, I, I do like Liverpool. A lot of people are really nice over there. Um, on average, I mean, it seemed like a lot of people were for a city. It's quite friendly. Mm. And it's a good compact city as well. It's not too big. You can walk. It's a good walking city to get around most places. You can walk. Yeah, yeah that's what. That's one thing I liked about it. But um, and that was uh, a reason. Uh, oh, by the way, um, uh, when you saw it was Isla Man, I mean, yeah, that was one reason that I chose. Um, I chose. Uh, because you could you could nail the ac your accent was the closest to it first of all <laughs> oh I mean. was it oh good yeah well my uh, uncle lived in the isle of man for a long time and we only visited him once uh i was very young it was the first time i'd actually been on a plane and we took a vickers viscount from liverpool's old airport speak airport to uh, to the isle of man so it was quite an exciting thing and uh, uh, but I liked it there. I thought it was great. It's uh, I'd love to live there, particularly for the um, the tax reasons. But um, they have very, very friendly um, tax uh, arrangements. And as you say, you can get the ferry across to Liverpool pretty easy. And I like to go to the football at Liverpool. So the Isle of Man, if I could live there and then visit Anfield either by plane or by uh, by boat that'd be great but I, I don't know um, well we did this book through ACX and uh, ACX you have to be based in the UK USA Canada or Ireland for it to work because they have yeah. tax arrangements with those territories um, the Isle of Man is not actually in the UK although it uh, it uses English it money couldn't you register it as the UK anyway? Um, uh, Are you, because... could, you probably, I think you need a, a bank account in the UK, which yeah. I wouldn't think would be too hard because I've got one, but I think you need a permanent address, postal address in the UK uh, okay. to make it um, work. Maybe I should investigate it more because it, the tax yeah. advantages are considerable. Yes. Well, um, it's funny you mentioned that because um, I'm working on a video game right now and, and um, I submitted a, an application to the Isle of Man for a, a visa for a company, Innovators Visa. Yeah, and um, yeah, you're right. It it, it is uh, the tax um, the tax laws are very friendly. It's it's easy to to have communication with the government because it's quite small and um, yeah, and so it's very. Uh, I mean, I've taught I've walked to the Department of Enterprise over there, walked into there. They get granted me and into uh, like they just sat down and talked with me. I did, had no appointment or whatsoever, so. Um, but I, I'm kind of curious about that because you have ACX. Uh, I would be using Steam, which is where people play their PC games and everything. I see. And yeah. I would be very curious on how they would do it because, you know, you had to do the bank account through ACX and you had to do it through the UK. I kind of wonder if Steam does the same thing and only allows the UK because that would be a bit of a problem for me. But I assume if a lot of the banks in Isle of Man are just very similar to the UK anyway. They're the same chains, I think. Uh, yeah. I, th I think, yeah, from from memory, I think it's Barclays and NatWest and the Big Five, they used to call them. They're probably... H H yeah, they're the same... H HSBC. Yeah, they're the same banks. They're just yeah. a uh, an Isle of Man version of them. So it would be... It would be easy to set... It would be easy to move there. I mean, um, as long as you got accepted 
uh, by the authorities there and to do banking and all that and they speak english and it's easy but uh, right. it's it's acx doesn't ex it isn't in the uk and the uk is one of the four countries you have to be resident in for right, yeah. so. acx to work so i don't know so w what's your connection to the isle of man because it is a tiny little island that really <laughs> only has one big thing which is the tt motorbike race every year it's uh it's a holiday destination for a lot of people from the uk even though it's in the irish sea so it doesn't necessarily have holiday weather um so what's your connection to the isle of man then elman so um <clears throat> so in newcastle you have this um convention called SunnyCon. um it's an anime convention they have it every year i'll be there this year um, in newcastle in, in the usa no, in um, Newcastle upon Tyne, over in um, you oh, know. in the northeast of the UK, I used to live up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I do that convention. Um, I, I like doing that convention. I, I try to go to that one every year. Um, they had in 2019, they had it in Liverpool. Right. the The turnout wasn't so great, but I did that one, and because I was in Liverpool, and I I I saw Isle of Man. I, I always like looking up these small islands and these out of the way places on the globe ever since i was a kid and i saw isla man uh pitcairn island islands have you heard of those i think it's belongs to in the, the south English. pacific yeah like stuff well, like that the pitcairn is where the uh, mutiny on the bounty mutiny has ended up yeah i think so and um, yeah i think so they I would look up stuff like that and little islands like that and i would just you know because I, I don't know i would and then when I looked up Isle of Man, I was like, this place sounds really nice. It, it, you know, um, and everything I read about it is like, this sounds too good to be true. So when I was doing a convention in Liverpool, I saw, saw it. Um, what's that? It, there was a ferry and I, yeah. was, I, I figured since I'm over in Liverpool, I'm never over there very often. This would probably be one of my few chances to go to Isle of Man. So I, I, I bought a ticket, went over. Um, I didn't want to leave um yeah i was as soon as i left i, I only stayed like uh, just a few days the first time but as soon as i left i was already feeling like i want to go back um but people were i i don't know if, if you got this but um i i felt very welcomed there everybody was super friendly um you know and um you know me being working at, me working in law enforcement for 10 years um it's uh like if i'm around the states you know i can't turn that um that law enforcement type of mentality off uh, because you put me in any, you take me to Disney World or you take me to the, you know, shopping mall, I'll see the types of people I dealt with on the job. Um, right. You know, I can pick them out of the crowd, usually. What? The, Island the, Man. The, the, you're talking about the wrong ones, are you? You're talking about crims. Yes, yes. So, right. So, like, you know, people who, you know, well, here we got the people who do meth or, or such like that. If you look up people walmart.com or something like that you could probably find a good examples but um but um you know it's it, it's it's that mentality i can't turn it off i couldn't turn it off i i, I but in isla man i was actually able to relax you know because it's 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 a lot safer over there yeah um and uh, and i actually looked up this uh thing they had on um psychopathy and they they said the united states with the prisons tend to have a higher rate of psychopathy than in the UK. Right. So, yeah. And, um, it's, I mean, it's so like the, the, it was, a I, I, I can't remember the study, but, um, the amount of, uh, prisoners who kill themselves due to guilt of committing a homicide is higher in the UK than in the U S uh, and that's, probably because of guilt and such like that. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a study on psychopathy and, um, in a way, I kind of wonder if that's true because we have like all our shoot mass shootings and, and, you know, well, in the seventies and eighties, we had serial killers. We had loads of them and there are mm -hmm. a lot of them are in the U S although yeah. we do document them more than like third world countries, but it's, it's significantly higher than the UK. And, we we have fewer serial killers nowadays, but I think that's because they just go to mass shootings or mass killings in some other form. They just kind of changed what their their um, their mo's and doing it. So, wow, it's interesting Sorry. you're talking about your, your previous life in law enforcement. How long were you a police officer? 
uh, 10 years. And um, I just switched wow. over about a year and a half ago to um, I do writing full time, but I'm doing a video game series based on uh, one of my book series. So that's uh, so with that video game series, that's how I'm trying to start with Isla Man. We'll see if it goes or not. Um, I'm still in contact with their um, Department of Enterprise as we speak. Just had an email from them today. So um, so it's a uh, if I get over, um, you know, I, I, I take it you're not you're not living around that area anymore, are you? No, I'm living about 30 miles north of London in uh, the county of Hertfordshire, which is one of the home counties, as they call them. And uh, yeah, in Hitchin in Hertfordshire is where I live, which is lovely. It's half an hour on the train right into central London. So, okay. yeah. So if you if you're in the country and I can't see you going out of your way to visit Hitchin because it's only a town of about 40,000 people. But you'll probably go to London at some stage. If you want to meet up in London, we'll go and have lunch. But uh, yeah. I hope hope I don't have a repeat of what happened to the last guy that I did that with two Fridays ago. There's a guy who I know in Chicago called Jonathan Brandmeyer. He's a legendary broadcast, legendary morning man in, in uh, Chicago. Anyway, his brother was coming to London, who is an author. And he said, oh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be in town. I'd like to meet you. I said, great, let's do it. So we arranged to go to this pub, which I won't name for reasons which will become clear in just a second. Anyway, so that was on the Friday. On the Monday night, uh, I felt like shit. I mean, I'm shivering and all sorts of things, and I'm going down with some cold or other. Anyway, by so on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then but then by the Thursday, Julie's got it as well, my wife, so she's had to come home from work. And on the Friday, I get an email from Michael, who had flown back to the States on the Saturday. We'd had lunch on the Friday. And he said, uh, hey, yeah, I hope you're feeling okay, because when I got back, I felt like shit, and I took a test, and I have COVID. And I thought, what? So Julie took the test and bingo, we've both got COVID. Right now I've got COVID, you know, I'm getting over it. So oh, really? uh, if you do come over, I'm hoping that doesn't happen again. I think I got COVID <laughs> in uh, Liverpool when I came over. You actually. did? Really? Yeah, but, um, COVID doesn't do too much to me. Um, I mean, I, I get a headache, but... Um, yeah, I, I got I, that, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just... Um, and the first time I had COVID, I, I didn't know when I was still working. Um, we had lockdown for, well, in Florida, we had lockdown for like, what, six weeks? At the okay. Most. No, we had a couple yeah. of years at it off and on. Yeah. Yeah. Our governor, he opened degrees. it up. So I, I had to go to work and everything. And because and, um, bad guys still go out. They don't care about lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, they're not going to let a virus and, stop them. Yeah, and the first time I got it, it was um, I I was arresting this girl. It, it was court ordered arrest because um, I was doing the courthouse at the time. And um, she said after I put her in the car, take her to the jail. She told they they asked her for symptoms. Was she having symptoms of COVID? She goes, Yeah, I've I've been exposed to people. I was partying with people who had who tested positive. And I told her, I was like, You should have told me that before I put you in a car. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I started. Um, uh, basically, I just lost a sense of smell, which is great because if you're working as a police officer, you, you go into some houses, <laughs> and um, um, some of the smells are really bad. I mean, some people feel like throwing up just smelling it, and, and I'm like, oh, I don't smell anything. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks it looks horrible. Um, I see feces everywhere on the floor and everything, but I don't smell anything. So this is, uh, and then um, you know, and of course, my little one at the time. Um, you know, I was still having to wipe her bum after, you know, she had a poo and she was like, this one's really going to stink, daddy. And I was like, God, I don't smell anything. This is great. You know, so, um, you can but, recommend it to parents and law enforcement people around the world. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 I didn't mind not having a smell. Um, but uh, other than that, yeah, it was very mild. I had RSV, though, this um, December. That was worse. What's that? It's a respiratory um it's a respiratory viral infection. Okay. So <clears throat> I was, that put me under like it, the both times I, two times I had COVID, I'd rather have those combined than RSV again. That's how wow. bad RSV was. And um, I think um, it, there was an older person I knew it killed. And, um, and I was like telling people if, if, if I was older, like by 20 or 30 years, I think it would have killed me. Um, wow. That's how bad it was. It was it, it just, yeah, I, I, um, so, uh, but 
No, COVID didn't do too much for me, but I did know some people who died because of complications from it. I'm sure you've probably known some people in the UK as well. Luckily, I've not known anybody directly. I've known people who've had relatives that it got, but I, there's not somebody I know that it, it took out, luckily. Yeah. So, but uh, well, I, I wish you speedy recovery on that. You seem you seem all right on the video. Oh, I'm but, fine. I, mean, I, had, I had, like I say, I had two or three days there but uh, where I couldn't record but uh because my voice was just too croaky but apart from that it's just a headache and a bit tired so i have a, i've had a sleep today during the day but that's about the only difference to my usual routine so it's you you've, think, you've like, led like a really interesting life because that's quite the career change from police officer to video game developer and author plus you've lived in different countries so i mean i can't claim law enforcement but you know i i've gone through career chain lived in different countries i've lived in new zealand uh for seven years australia for six and a half years uh, the uk for which the rest of the time what was that which did you prefer um my composer awesome. is actually from new zealand so really whereabouts in yeah. new zealand your composer from oh gosh uh, i'd have to look at his town um but uh, he's uh, you know that's a good question <laughs> i should well, ask him. both both countries gave me a lot uh, for instance, I met my wife in New Zealand. She's a Kiwi. And um, I got into my first working band, or two actually in the end, bands in New Zealand. New Zealand was where we first, was where we got married in the Bay of Islands. Um, we lived in Whangarei, which is up near the top of the North Island. And uh, so, nice there. yeah, it's beautiful. But when we were, we got married, we'd been married three years and I'd lived in New Zealand seven years and had never visited Australia, which I still don't know why I didn't. So we went on holiday to Sydney for a week and we came back to New Zealand and six weeks later we had the house on the market and we were living in Sydney. We just went. Oh, really? Yeah, because I'd taken out New Zealand citizenship by then and um, you don't need a visa or a work permit or anything. You can just show up and i was an air conditioning engineer at the time which is a sought after trade in a hot country like australia right. and so it was easy to find work i just picked up the yellow pages and went and, and rang up the ones with the biggest ads because i figured they would pay the most money and uh got hired straight away and so we arrived i arrived literally with a suitcase and a toolbox and we didn't know anyone in australia and really i got into radio in australia it's where my broadcasting career started and um um, of the two, to say which one I prefer, both for different reasons, but I, I really enjoyed Australia. I really liked the vibe of, of Australia, and it was exciting. We were in a little town, probably the size of Hitchin in Whangarei, uh, but we went to Sydney, which was the you know big city. Um, so it was really exciting that uh, as a young couple, you know, three years married, to go just the two of us to 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 head out and do an, have an adventure together. So. I, I, and I got into radio in Australia, which changed my life. So, yeah, it's funny you should mention profiling people. You've just reminded me of something. When I was an air conditioning engineer, we used to do the maintenance of the air conditioning of the police, all the police stations and courthouses in Sydney. The, the contractor I worked for, that's what we did. And the first time we went to the police station at King's Cross, I don't, have you ever been to Sydney? No, I haven't. Um... I haven't been in Australia yet. The closest is probably Japan. And um, believe it or not, yeah. there's a lot of Aussies in, um, in Japan. Are so. there? Really? I've been to Tokyo, yeah. but only for a few days. But anyway, so we get to King's Cross Police Station. And King's Cross is, well, it's the red light area. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of colorful characters in King's Cross, if you know what I mean. So Some we people. got there. We got there just before lunchtime at the police station. So we went into the um, the police station and we dropped the tools, me and an apprentice, and we dropped the tools and it was just before lunch. We thought, right, we'll go out, we'll get something to eat, and then we'll come back and then we'll have a look at them doing the maintenance on this air conditioning plant in this, in this building that the police station's in. This is what we'll do. So we dropped off the tools and we walked down the street from the police station and walking towards us, I was like, shocked at the shall we say the variety of people you know some of them so scary you know when you're talking about you know maybe psychopaths or crims or whatever all walking past us and i'm thinking 
my goodness, I've, you know, I've been to the cross before, but I've never kind of walked around, but it was broad, broad daylight. So we go and we find something like a McDonald's or something. We have lunch. And then we go back to the police station, pick up the tools, and we start checking out the air conditioning and where everything is. And we walked into the lunchroom, and there, sat in the lunchroom at the table, is every one of these psychopaths that had, had just walked up to us. They were all cops. <laughs> they were all undercover cops. Every single one of them, you know, tattooed and pierced here, there and everywhere. You know, they were just... And that was how they policed uh, the King's Cross district of Sydney. It was quite an eye-opener to see how it works. Yeah, we, had, we shouldn't have been scared of them at all. They were all cops. <laughs> yeah well yeah you got you got some of they try to uh, I, I remember when i first started as a police officer they um they set up some call for me because they thought i was really timid and um they got one of um basically it was a call about a suspicious vehicle in a park and um they got one of our uh, narcotic guys um he was this really tall black dude and you know, and then basically when I went to the car, expired tag, um, warrant for like something. So basically there were, and he was, and the, the thing he was supposed to do was he was supposed to be very defiant with me and he was going to resist. Yeah. So. But you thought, thought he was, they, you thought he was for real. You didn't know he was on the Yeah, they didn't tell me. Um, <laughs> they, they said that, which was quite unfair for me because I found out they didn't do it to the other guys, the other new people, especially the other two females they hired. Um, and they didn't hi do it to this other guy they hired as well. Um, and it was, uh, they did it to me because um, I, I, I don't know why they did it to me. I think they thought I was just timid because I, I'm, when I police, I'm really polite to people. Um, usually, unless, I mean, it's a real jerk, but I'm usually polite. Yes, sir. How's it going? I don't do that. You know, um, I don't just get that, I guess that mean attitude from the get go or whatnot. So, uh, personable, I try to be personable when I talk to people for the most part. So they were surprised how quick I went hands on with this guy. Well, I was about to throw him down and that's when they intervene and go, he's one of us. He's one of us. And <laughs> they and had that, to they, tell they, you, they, they were that worried for his safety. They had to tell you he's one of you. Well, they left me alone after that. They said, okay, you're good to go. I mean, uh, after that, they stopped trying to put me on all the, you know, test me and everything. Cause they, they, they were just worried that I'd be too timid, but I was like, no, that doesn't bother me. It's just, I'd rather be, you know, polite to people, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't too happy when I found out the other ones didn't have that same test. That no, I did. no, that isn't fair. If it, you, you, you understand a rite of passage and a, a, a certain amount of hazing for the rookie, but you don't expect it, especially, you know, if there's a couple of female and they don't have to go through it. Yeah. Wow. But, um, yeah, they do that. They tried that. Uh, and I went to another agency and one of the, uh, and what, what they do to the new guys, they give him all the reports to do. Yeah. And so, if they do a traffic stop and they get a bunch of like dope and all this other stuff for an arrest, they'll try to give it to the new guy so he can learn. And I remember when I switched to an agency, they tried to do that to me. And of course I had eight years in by this time I said, no, you, you, you pulled that fish out. You, you, you've got that fish yourself. I ain't doing that. <laughs> and, and, of course, and, and then they kind of looked at my, my train, supposedly my trainer who I actually had more experience than him. And, I, and then he said, yeah, he's, he's worked for eight years. So, and then they, they left me alone, but, um, but, uh, it's no, it's, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, why, why I switched, um, technically, uh, I was, I was a bit, I, I could still keep doing it, but, um, if you're going to do something, um, and maybe you realize this when you were doing a radio or something, if you're doing something else at the same time, which you can do, but it's best to focus on something you want to be really good at 100% than, you know, yeah. otherwise it's a hobby in a way. Yeah, I pretty much, uh, uh, I was lucky with radio. I went to a very, very good radio broadcasting school in Australia, the Australian Film, TV and Radio School. So I got I got uh, professional broadcasting jobs straight away in there. The one where I did make the switch was going to audiobook narration because I was still doing bits and pieces of broadcasting. And I used, I got to the point where Thursdays was the day of the week when I worked on two radio stations. And in the end, I decided I was having so much fun narrating authors' audiobooks from all over the world and having fun with the characters and all the rest of it. And I really thought, well, you know, I did radio for pretty close to 30 years. 
nice to try and just concentrate on something different for a while. And so I gave up those two radio jobs, which is unusual because pretty much all the other radio jobs I had, I got fired from <laughs> to actually quit a couple of radio jobs. I didn't get fired from any Australian radio. I worked for three radio stations in Australia along the way. I didn't get fired from any. It was all the British ones I got fired from. Really? Um, but, What'd you do, Graham? I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I did much at all. And, and after a while, I got sick of being fired and I was taking jobs as program director in the end thinking, well, they can't fire the boss. Yes, they can. <laughs> and the final one, they, they fired me just before the pandemic, which is how I started doing uh, audio books uh, because I had to work from home. And uh, because, you know, no radio stations were hiring and, and I started doing more and more. But I still had this Thursday was my radio day. And in the end, I thought, no, I'm going to do audio books on a Thursday as well. And it's just been great. And working on your book was so much fun. Um, you'd written, uh, the, you know, I was telling Ju Julie... In fact, tonight, Julie said, who are you talking to tonight? And I said, uh, I'm talking to Elman. And he, he wrote the uh, the magical constabulary. And she said, which one was that? I said, oh, that's the one where the, you know, the kid's book. I said, uh, you know, where there's a kid, he's almost a bit, the beginning of the book is almost uh, Cinderella-like. He's with, you know, he's got a couple of brothers who, he's like a male Cinderella. He's got a couple of brothers who are obnoxious and, and <laughs> all he gets to eat is slug soup. And she's like, oh yeah, I remember you talking about that. Because I talk about the books that I'm, she's, you know, she says at the end of the day, what have you been working on today? And I talk about it. So, but just, you know, you know, the, you could see in her face, when I told this image of slug soup, you know, and these brothers who, one of them who loves farts and just, you know, it's just a great book. And you've said it on the Isle of Man. Was that just because you had visited the island or was there any other reason why you used the Isle of Man as a, as a canvas so, to paint the story on? So... Um... That story, um, I didn't intentionally try to write a children's book. Um, I was uh, you didn't? working. No, I was a deputy um, during the last year and a half uh, of my law enforcement career. I was a deputy, a school resource officer. Uh, so um, they assigned me to a primary school, and basically, um, so in, in in most schools in the United States, and especially in the state of Florida, um, you have to have a police officer at every school or some type of hired armed personnel that's, you know, has a standards. Um, so they, in, in the county I'm in, every school has a deputy. <clears throat> and um, our only job, our main job e is to protect. You say every school has a deputy? Uh, like because from law shooter. enforcement? Uh, this started uh, because of the Parkland um, shooting. Of course, um, yeah. Yeah, this started because so my job was just to protect the students from out, any harm from within or outside coming in. And, and you're to, armed. You're armed as yes. well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we uh, yeah, I mean, um, well, well, all police officers are armed in the United States. I mean, and I mean, uh, and most most will even have like in my agency, you know, you had your um, nine millimeter Glock and then you had a. Which I had uh, my previous agency. I had a forty caliber, which um, I kind of liked better, but uh, because it's a stronger round. Um, but then we had uh, AR fifteen. Um, we also had a uh, which I had my own AR fifteen, but the agency can assign you one. Um, and then you, you can also you also have a shotgun, which um, agency can assign you. Or uh, in my case, when I was my previous one, I had my own shotgun. It looked like a it, it's it was is a Russian made actually. It's a it, it looks like an AK forty seven. I just modified it, and it's a it, it looks it was heavy though. I hate I, I I I if I had to hold it for a long time, I mean you're gonna build some muscles with that thing, but um, but yeah, that's that's one reason. Um, that's another reason for Isle of Man. You we talked about. Um, I want my kids to go there. It's a bit. If it's a Isle of Man gave me a bit more feeling of safety with the kids. Right, so. I see, I see. So you wanted to set the characters in an in an otherwise safe environment because they're safe well, from. No. Oh, yeah? I meant with my kids. I, I want my kids <laughs> oh, to go to Ireland. So, oh, I see, um, I see. But why why was the book set there then? So the book was set. Um, so when I was a de deputy, of course, my job was to protect the kids. But that was my only job is to make sure the kids are safe. And, and occasionally I'll do traffic outside or I'll just make an outside presence. It's just the presence, you know, the show people that there's a police officer at the school. Yeah. So 
you have a lot of free time. And with that free time, I just go walk around. You know, I also have to check all the door. We have to lock all the doors to keep all the doors locked. So somebody can't just go up to the school and enter. So I would go around to the classrooms occasionally and the, the teachers would say, hey, you want to read a book to my class? So I started reading books to the class. And, um, you know, and I'm I, now I'm not a narrator like you. Um, so I can't do I mean, but I mean, but I, I would try I would do like different voices, different accents. So, you know, so I started reading the books, but I noticed the kids would get bored with whatever the teachers gave me. So I said, uh, can I I've written a few books. Uh, do you mind if I just write a story myself and just bring it to class? And so I chose Isla Man because it's different. It's a different place, a location. So I wanted to educate them about somewhere else besides the United States. Yeah. Um, uh, because our our education system goes on American history, American history, American history. Um, we don't do a lot in our public schools. We don't go into like um, history of Asia very much or history of Europe. Um, so like the Saxon Vikings era, very few people even know much about that. Or is that's that's I don't even remember learning about that in school. I had to learn about that on my own and right. uh, walking through half these castles in England <laughs> for that. So. Yeah. So when I started, I wrote the first chap, two chapters of uh, Magical Constabulary, just messing around. Um, I, 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 I picked up a couple of children's books to get the vocabulary feel because um, um, I don't know. Do you um, I, I was trying to go for a second grade level, which is first form, I think, in the UK or Isle of so, Man is first so, form. So what age would the kids be, the target? Uh, I was trying to aim for seven and older. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so when I started reading these chapters, they, they all perked up. They love, you know, kids love toilet humor. They love farts and, you know, farts and slugs, slug soup. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they, I had their attention immediately. And when I finished the chap, the first chapter, uh, I had the second one in hand. They said they wanted me to continue. I finished the second one and they wanted more. So, um, and, and because I had downtime at the school, I was able to go on my computer in my office and type up another chapter. Like I, I type one up a, once a week. Um, every week I would type a new one up and then I'd come, I'd, once a week I'd come to class, read them a new chapter. And then I started getting a few other teachers asking me to read to their class because I guess word got around. Um, wow. And um, yeah, and, and I got really good feedback from the kids. So they wanted, they wanted more and they loved it. Uh, a couple of the kids are like, I love this better than Harry Potter. And I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I think it's better and, than Harry Potter. I, I like what you've done is, uh, you know, at the time when I was uh, narrating it, I had no idea you were an ex-cop. And this is about a police force in the Isle of Man that specifically recruits children because children can see the bad guys. When we talk about bad guys, we're talking about goblins and giants and elves and, and that that kind of thing which is a lovely right. idea it's a lovely idea because it makes the kids special they've got a they've got a superpower that the adults don't have i like that right and i mean and if you do talk to kids i mean they will tell you they see certain kids will tell you they see things like you know that that you know apparently we can't see so that's where i also because i mean i got I'm a, my little daughter she'll say like uh you know can you leave the door open that doorknob comes closer at me at night you know, when it, when the lights are out, you know, right. the, you know, they yeah. got, you know, whereas, I mean, you know, maybe we would logically, uh, assume, okay, you look at something and look away and look at something again, you know, there is an illusion with your eyes that makes it appear like it's moved, but it hasn't, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Whereas kids, if they, if they do that, they'll imagine it's, it takes on a life of its own, or I, I don't know, maybe they do see something, <laughs> but I'm not going to argue with them on that. Um, no. but, I, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I used to like, you know, th thought I would see certain things that, you know, obviously adults, the adults would tell me that's not there, you know, well, we're, we're, you, yeah. that's just your imagination. But um, faces in the so, curtains, there's always a lot of faces you'd see. When you're yeah, yeah. It's, you yeah. probably have memories of something like that when you were little, too. And it goes away yeah. as you get older, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah. I ran with that idea and um, and, you know, and obviously uh yeah i use the same helm the the artwork um uses the same um helmets that the uniform the kit that the police constables have in isle of man the, the helmet's the same yeah so um 
And then some of the creatures, like the Vuggins and um, the fairies, they're they're yeah. based in Isle of Man because you have to greet the fairies when you cross the fairy bridge. And that that one fairy bridge is in the artwork. It's actually in um, Isle of Man. It's it's really that's hard a real to bridge. To. Right. That's a real bridge. And the art is the same. It's, it's taken from that location as well. Like the sketch. I don't know if this, the, the, the version of the PDF I sent you, did it have the sketchings inside? Like the No, it did. Uh, no, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Okay. Yes. So they're so in the print fairy... version of the book too, of course. Yeah. Yes, they're in yeah. the print version. But that fairy bridge is a real place. Um, really, people make offerings there to, and such. Um, it's, it's a really nice area. Um, but uh, so yeah, you could tap uh, into some of the mystical stories of the Isle of Man as well. You could use that. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Some and research re refreshing the... because a lot of people have used places, you know, mystical stories from Ireland and Scotland and Wales and whatever. But the Isle of Man, not so much because it's small. So you, you've got a unique thing on it there. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying. Oh, no. And that's another thing is I walked through some of these places and it gave me, you know, um, and it's the same with my other fantasy series like, um, uh, you know, I'll I'll go through these areas and walk through them to get some idea. Like, um, have you have you heard of um that place? It's in a uh, what's that? Uh, Peak District in England. Yeah. Um, it's called yeah. It's called Eam. Eam. It, they had the plague there in 1666. I don't. Are you familiar with that town? No, I'm not. I know the Peak District because I lived in the East Midlands for a while. And also, when I was at school, we had to do a thing called the the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme, and they. They, they, you basically camp out and you have to follow a map and whatever. And uh, anyway, oh, the group, cool. the group I was with, got lost near a place called <laughs> Wild Boar Clough uh, in in the Peak District. So I, I know the, but I don't know that town. No, I know Buxton and places like that. Yeah. Okay, it's it's quite a. It's about probably thirty minutes, forty five minutes from. Well, maybe thirty minutes from Buxton. Um, it's okay. A little, I think it's southeast of Castleton. Okay. Right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. they had the plague and all that. I took that whole scenario and put that into one of my stories. Um, I'll walk some of these places like in uh, Castleton or I'll go to Peel Castle and or I'll just go to um, certain areas like like um, some of the caves in the Peak District. And, um, you know, and you, you'll you'll see some stone circles and such like that stuff like that. I mean, just walking it, it makes my imagination run wild. I, I don't. You don't get that here in the States, unfortunately, uh, because we, I mean, besides the American, Native American Indians, we don't have, um, I mean, you, you can find arrowheads in certain areas and they'll, they'll be remnants of such, but we don't have like the structures that remain. And yeah. W yeah. when you walk these structures, it gives you like a certain feeling like uh, there's people been here before me, loads of people, and there was lifetimes of like memories here. And yeah. I always try to imagine that sort of thing when I walk these areas. So um, that maybe that that's that. So Isle of Man, that's why I wrote about it, because I walked through some of these areas. And as I'm walking them, I, I get these ideas and I, I think about things like I think about weird things like that when most people are like, oh, that's a pretty flower. <laughs> I just <laughs> think about, oh, I wonder um, I wonder what kind of couple used to hang out. I mean, I, I imagine a thousand years ago, someone took their date over here or they were courting someone or. You know, they might have had a little picnic here or, you know, um, maybe somebody picked a fight with their, you know, rival over here, you know. So that's the so, sort of stuff I think about. And where does the character of Ivor come from? Because he's pretty uh, together, but he's really intimidated when he joins the, the magical constabulary because he really is the rookie. He's a bit like you being, <laughs> being set up a lot of the time, like your first day when you were with the police force. Where does his character come from then? Interesting, uh, interesting uh, observation. Maybe I never thought about it that way. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's where pulling... that comes from. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you're pulling apart my psych a bit. Um <laughs> So I went to um, a park over there, and I, 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 like you said, Isle of Man's a big melting pot. Um, so I went, I took my little one to a park over there in 2019, and of course, um, one of the kids was getting a bit out of control. He had this little ice cream uh, sh milkshake, and he threw it at another kid, and and it just splattered, and he just he just left it there. So I told him, I said, I said, look, all right, first of all. Well, he was acting a bit out of order for a while. So finally, I just cut into him. I said, hey, first of all, pick up your rubbish, throw it in a bin and stop acting acting like that or you're out of here. And 
and then uh, immediately he gets shame on his face. He says, sorry. You know, he looks at me, sorry. And then he, he actually did it. And, um, and, and then, I mean, and the look of, he had genuine, um, what was that? He really genuinely felt apologetic. So you could see it in his face. So I felt so bad for the kid. And, and also when I get on to kids, so when, when I was a school resource officer, if I got onto a kid and I was, I had to raise my voice, I would pull him aside later and say, look, you know, I'm still your buddy. I'm still your friend. Um, you know, I still like you, but what you did was wrong. But, you know, if you need any help or you something bothering, you can come to me anytime. All right. You know, it, 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 just, I, I had to yell at you, but I still like you. OK. And and that's because, you know, I, you probably went to school and you had some teacher or something just yell at you and just stayed that way. And then you go, this this teacher hates my guts. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I I try to do that every kid. So he he was terrified of me until I said that. And then um, and whilst my little one was playing, I was doing pull ups and all that on the bars they had there. And um, so he wanted to train with me. So I, I, I showed him. And then all of a sudden, the rest of the children on the playground, they heard my accent. So and I, I don't think Isle of Man has too many Americans that they rarely get American visitors there. They all go to Scotland and Ireland and all that you know, or yeah. London. Yeah. So um, so all the kids, I was a real novelty to them. So they started asking me all kinds of questions like, do you know who uh, like they would name famous people? Have you do you know, have you talked to so and so before? And and they asked, of course, they asked if I had guns and um, <laughs> silly questions like that. Um, but well, um, as it turned out, not so silly with you, but still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, um, I, I got quite a few, but um, I mean, but uh yeah, with with the children, I, I realized I, I started asking them where they're from. I mean, if one was this was in Ramsey where this happened. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, like two of them said they were from Ramsey. Another kid was like, I'm from Scotland. Another kid was from Wales. Another one was from Manchester. So um, so that's where I got the idea from Ivor. Sorry for the long story to tell it. But Ivor was um, all the way. Uh, he, I, I got it because I've talked to so many kids there and they're from they're from the, U, you know, the rest of the UK. Hmm. Kid, we, it never happened at my school, but kids used to go on uh, on school trips to the Isle of Man. There's a there's quite a famous picture of some kids from a school, and they're in the they're at the beach in the Isle of Man. I don't know. I think they're at Douglas. I don't know, but they're at the they're at the beach in the water, and in the picture, one of the people in the picture grew up to become Jimmy Tarbuck, who is a famous comedian here. And another kid in the picture is one of Jimmy Car Tarbuck's schoolmates because they were in the same class, and it's John Lennon. So oh. he he uh, from Liverpool, you know, um, some yeah, schools. Yeah, the Beatles are uh, from Liverpool, so that's that's right. Yeah, so uh, the Bee Gees are from Isle of Man. They have a big old. The Bee Gees are from the Isle of Man. Yeah, actually, I saw a band. I was at a radio convention in Chicago, and there was a band from the Isle of Man playing at the radio convention and they were a really good blues rock band and i've not caught up with them since i've got their cd they were only young guys and they were called backdoor slam and they were from that the isle works. of man so it's got okay. it's got musical credentials the isle of man yeah it does yeah. although i wasn't a fan of the Bee Gees, and um uh, obviously liverpool <laughs> wasted wasted on me because i'm not a fan i mean I, 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 the beatles are great but i'm just i'm more of an iron maiden person and um, okay i believe most of them are from the London area. Um, give yeah. or take. Um, my my that. only claim, my only claim to fame is, and I can say this with all honesty, I had John Lennon's old job, and I <laughs> and I didn't know till many years later. In fact, it was only about five or six years ago. I was on BBC Radio Merseyside, and I was reading Mark Lewison's book, which is about the early days of the Beatles. And he mentions in this book that John Lennon used to have a job washing the dishes at Liverpool Airport. And I was like, when I was 14, my Saturday job was washing dishes in the Argyle restaurant at Liverpool Airport. Now, I don't even know if I washed the dishes in the same restaurant in the airport. It wasn't a big airport back then. But as far as I'm concerned, I had John Lennon's old job. And the thing is now, that airport has closed and that's the one I flew to the Isle of Man from. Liverpool okay. now Liverpool now has a new airport um, 
just down the road, in the same area of Liverpool, but just down the road from the old airport. And the new airport is called John Lennon Airport. That's the name of it. So clearly they named the airports there after the people who used to wash the dishes there. So I'm waiting for the next one to open because that'll be named after me if they use the same protocol. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose if you, if you do enough of the, the right people's audio books, you know. Yes, you know, exactly. Maybe. Yes, yes. You'll have to well, get... Well, look, obviously, obviously you are going to usurp uh, J.K. Rowling, with the oh, wow. in, in the genre you, you're you're in for that. I mean, obviously you. I know I, you do. I, I know her, you do novels as well. But yeah, I've read so. her last. Um, I'm I, I'm not a Harry Potter fan, uh, and I wasn't really a fan of hers. But um, I read her last book. It was called Christmas Pig, mm -hmm. and it was because my little one read it. And um, that book is a masterpiece as far as okay. children's books go. Yeah, and. I mean, this is from someone who's not a Harry Potter fan. I wasn't going in with the expectations. But when I read this, I was like, wow, this is written very well. Um, each chap, there is no waste. The, each chapter is great. It, you know, it's it's good. It's emotional. It's it's good character. I, I, she she deserves a lot of props for that book. And I, So I, she's got the hang of it now, after all those Harry well, Potter books. I think she's always had the hang of it quite a bit. I mean, but... Um, but I, like I said, I wasn't a fan of the Harry Potter series. But when I read Christmas Pig, I was um, I was very impressed with her. And um, if I could even write something half that as good as Christmas Pig, I would be happy. So okay, um, well, I I don't get the Harry Potter books either, and I don't know what it is. It's probably because it was a late night comedian from the U.S. It was either Jay Leno or Letterman. I can't remember which one it was. It may have been Jay Leno. I don't know. And they pointed out that, you know, if this kid's a wizard, so he can do magic, like he can make things fly and disappear and stuff, why can't he fix his eyes? He still needs glasses. <laughs> True. <laughs> and and whenever I yeah. see it now, it lets it lets it down for me. Yeah. That's that's a good point. And um you know, and what's the other sit fan the Tolkien. Um, yes, I don't get that. I, Lord of the Rings, I don't get that either. And that's got a big New Zealand connection as well, but I don't get that either. I don't right. get into it. So when I do these conventions and um, people, you know, loads of people who love Tolkien come up to me and they say, is this like Tolkien? And I say, I was like, actually, I don't like Tolkien. And you should, what? <laughs> what do you mean you don't like Tolkien? And, um, and um, I think there was this one um, English professor who said it best. Um, he said, like, it was one big, uh, one, uh, one big stroll, a big battle, and um, a giant feast and a bunch of rubbish songs afterwards, you know. <laughs> and, I, I mean, really, that's, I think that sums it up. I, I was always wondering why it was so boring. And it's, it's, if, if you put those four things in it, that's, that's the series. Over. Now, The Hobbit... I, I, that was a bit more interesting, but like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I was never a Tolkien fan. And, um, it's so funny because I know I've got work doing audiobooks because of Lord of the Rings, um, because of Harry Potter, you know, having an, an English accent as my narration voice, and also because of Game of Thrones. I have never watched a single episode of Game of Thrones, but sometimes I'll get epic fantasy. Uh, I get jobs which are epic fantasy books. I've done a series of uh, Goblin Summoner. I think I've done like, have I done seven or eight now? I've lost count of how many in this series I've done. You know, and, you know, people say like, oh, yeah, you know, it's uh, you must be a big fan of, um, what's it called, Game of Thrones. And, I, and I'll go... Mm, and I'm kind of on, and I've never seen a single episode, but they hear something in the way I do them that reminds them of that. So I'm certainly not copying it because, and sometimes they'll send me some authors that I've done f uh, fantasy books for. They will send me uh, what they want the characters to sound like, and they'll say, "Oh, can you sound like this character?" And I have to look them up on YouTube. Because I, they yeah. mean nothing to me. I have to right. do the research and then see and go, oh, yeah, I see. He's a Yorkshireman. Okay, I can do that uh, and do it that way. <laughs> yeah. But I, I know, but I know I've got work out of it. Yeah. That's funny. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm glad you – I'm glad somebody has a like 
like-minded opinion about um this i don't i don't care for game of thrones either so okay um, right yeah uh, because i think most of the characters are just um you know they're they're very dark and um i don't know i just don't like um i I don't like the setting and all that um i mean granted i'm sure it's you know it has its you know i know you can't argue with success let's face it but if it's i don't think it's my cup of tea because i don't think i've well i've never watched one yeah but I use it actually for when people ask, you know, I, so I have my God Shard Chronicles. Actually, I got your narration on that before this one started. Um, and I, I was torn between choosing you for that one and this other guy. I had to go with the other guy who was cheaper. So. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad it was a good reason. Well, well, because that um, is a good was, reason. <laughs> it, it was it was super close um, because. <laughs> The narration part, you were obviously, I mean, y- your narration is just hands down. Um, the thing was, he did have, like, he he did have a voice for, like, some of the characters. That, like, he had that gruffer, he was from Wales, but he had that okay. gruffer voice. And he was cheaper. But um, okay. it, was, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was a complete tie. Um, I, I mean, I would say it would be 51% in your favor, 49% him. But but yeah. the cheaper thing kind of pushed him. He's too, I, I'm going to use that because um, now and again when I, I put like quotes up of what authors have said and I'm going to use that somewhere one day. I'm going to use that. that I, I'm, I'm going to say uh, uh, Elman Dean Todd said, um, I was going to use you, but I found another guy who was cheaper. I mean, <laughs> that would be a great... <laughs> A great quote. You you were hands down the best audition I got, but I went with another guy who was cheaper. I mean, that would be a great quote, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. It was about, I think it was about <laughs> seventy an hour cheaper. So, but but you know when you tally that up, when it comes to like thirteen to fifteen hours. Oh yeah, um, it's gonna be a diff. It's gonna be a chunk of change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, but but no, I was I I, I did. Uh, so, but when your name popped up for magical constabulary, I was like, okay, hands down, you know, this this is. But um. And it's a shorter not, book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. Uh, so I it's think, within uh, budget. Even then, yeah. Um, your voice is also appealing for children too. Okay. Um, yeah, because oh, my, that's nice my little one. Know. She hates my fantasy series. She she doesn't even like. She thinks it's boring. You know, it's it's more for adults anyway. But she thinks it's boring. Yeah. But she read. She was listening to because I had to listen to your stuff to you know to prove it. And I had to go through each chapter, and she just couldn't yes. wait till you put out the new chapters. And um, you know, she was she was like, "This is a really good book. You need to write the sequel." And I was like, "Okay, wow. You usually just shit on everything I do. So that's my." <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I've given you some credibility. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, but um, another thing I was looking for um, yeah, fantasy. Um, I do like um for narrators. Um, I do like English. Um people from like the UK in general, you got so much to play with, with the accents. You got your Yorkshire, you got your, you know, Mancunian, you got your, you know, you got, you can go up to Scotland. Yeah. I mean, um, what was that? Uh, you, you, I mean, you have, of course you have your different London ones. You got your Cockney. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, even in Scotland, you got, what you got your West, uh, you know, you got, what was that? You know, it's well, you've got your, different. up there, you've got like, you've got your Highland Scotland who talk to you as if everything is amazing and mystical. And then you've got your Glaswegian Scotland and they say like, they just yeah. want to kick your bloody head down. Yeah. And they're, they're both yeah, Scottish, the, but yeah. And then you've got the Edinburgh the Glaswegian one. Glaswegian one's kind of, hard. <laughs> yeah, that's that one's hard for my difficult for my ears, but um okay right but yeah. um but th- that's the thing though is like I noticed a lot of narrators from the UK they can do like I because like on my Godshard Chronicles like the main character he's I, I I was thinking more of a Northern English you know that brash accent not quite yeah. Yorkshire maybe in the Thumberland area okay and, yeah yeah northeast yeah yeah. And then, like the female, she would have more of an RP accent, and then you know, um, and, and you know, there's like a, quite a mix. So that's why I didn't want somebody. Uh, although I did have one American narrator from New York, she actually did it in an English accent. She did the Northern English for him, and she yeah. did all the other accents. And I was, I was, I was impressed. She was that is impressive. She, she just didn't sound right. It, it's just her voice didn't sound right when she did the male characters. Okay, right. Because yeah, I have yeah, a. Yeah. In that series, a lot I have a lot of like really like gruff male, male characters, and but if I had like a female lead in that book, I mean she she was a and she she was an American, so I was um, well good for her. 
I mean, that, yeah. that, that makes me feel better because I've done a lot of books because when you audition, they tell you, some of them, they tell you uh, what accent they want. And a lot of them do say they want general American. And I've done a lot of business books, <laughs> the whole thing as American, and just said, I'm based in the UK, but don't tell them I'm not American. And I've got away with it so many times. So it's nice yeah. to know that there is an American stealing work from British narrators, just like there are British narrators stealing work from Americans. I think um, there's more Brits stealing from Americans, though, because, I mean, there, you'll see some actors like in Stranger Things and such like that, and they'll do an American accent, and uh, you'll find out later they're they're British. And um, Yes. Hugh Laurie, it, probably, from House as well, was a big one, wasn't he? How many seasons of House did he do as an American doctor? And he's he's from, uh, I don't know where he's from, he's family British. And probably goes home to his family and forgets he's British then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was um, there was one game I played a Dragon Quest Eleven. The guy Eric, um, he was uh, he was trying to do this like northern um, American, northeastern American accent, and um, but some some words would sound a so, I, I th about halfway through the game, I noticed a few words would sound a bit off. But I, he found out he was English, right? So, and that was why. That was why. But. He could do it much better. He could do that northern accent much better than I ever could. So yeah. I was I was too impressed. So <laughs> but but I did it despite me putting um general British for this one. Um yes. for magical constabulary. I did get a few Americans and you know, and this book has a lot of English. Barnaby is an English um name typical we don't have that name over here so often. Um right. so he reads it in this uh, you know, in his accent and he goes Barnaby. Barnabas. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then he yeah, read yeah. Bigsby. He read Bigsby, and I was like, "That's, <laughs> that's that's not the." And, and if he's mixed, <laughs> if he's botching those up, um, what's he going to do with the names in Isle of Man? You know, I mean, some of these places in Isle of Man have some really, um, I mean, it's based off of the old Manx language, you know. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's back to Celtic times, isn't it? And uh, right. And all so, that. Um, yeah. But. Um, you yeah you had the closest i think um because you could also you know it, it also helped that you've probably been over there i mean but I, I didn't know if you went over there or not i assumed like just i was like okay only, only the, i've only been once it's somewhere i'd love to go back to um i'll take my wife one day because that's the other good thing about having a new zealand wife in the uk is i can take her to place i've got a good ex excuse to go back to places i enjoyed when i was growing up and show them to her so the isle of man is one we've got to go and check out yeah. Well, I'll be there later this year. If you if you if you're if you go there later this year, I'll be there. Let me know. Let me know when you're there, Elman. Uh, oh, Elman... I'll be there. Um, Sorry? My, my kids are going to school there. They're enrolled in school in a private school there. So seriously. So, yeah. So. Um, Do they have we really went... good schools there? I didn't realize um, that. I don't know about the public school. Uh, although I, I would say it's probably better than. I mean, they don't have to have a police officer in every school. So I mean, I'll, going <laughs> off of that one, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take much for me to say a school's better. But um, uh, you know, it's now, now granted and the, the school I worked at was really good. I mean, I, I I worked at a really really nice primary school. It was it was really safe. I mean, it, it it's just. It's just a law we have. But I mean, I, we did get one crazy guy come to the school because he saw my police car at the front of it and he wanted to talk to a police officer about an incident he had and he decided to come to the school to do it. And um, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, I, I well, I had to tell him, I was like, you're not allowed on here. You're trespassing. You need to get out and away from these kids and you take that to the sheriff's office. Um, but I he, he had a simple question I was able to answer. But um. He, he was he was crazy, and, and the funny thing was, he tried to become a cop at one time too. <laughs> wow, wow! But but sorry, I got a little off topic there. Um, I tend to do that. Um, uh, <laughs> That's because so, you're a creative author. You're supposed to. You're supposed to go here, there, and everywhere, and then just then then you you suddenly land on something and go, got a story, got a character. <laughs> here it Here we go. Got it now. Well, the book is called, the book is wonderful. It's called Magical Constabulary, and it's by Elman Dean Todd. There are links to where you can get it on Amazon in the description to this if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, so, what is next for Elman Dean Todd? Um, I am actually. It's funny you ask that. I'm 
driving to Texas next week. Um, How long will that take? Um, two, it's, it says 11 hours if that's nonstop and that's, uh, to San Antonio from, so basically going from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana is a much shorter journey than from Louisiana of Texas to San Antonio. Texas is huge. Don't drive through there. Okay. And why are you driving to Texas? Um, I looked at the plane ticket and it was very expensive. And also if I got delayed, uh, it would probably delay me to the next day. So I figured... Uh, and also, um, so I partnered with a uh, Japanese manga artist. His name is Hiroshi Kanatani. He's, um, he does, uh, he's famous for his kaiju manga in Japan. He's published in um, Japan, but he does a lot of, he has, he's published he, in the United States too. I know and, what kaiju uh, is. I've done, uh, I've done kaiju books. Uh, they're monsters like Godzilla type monsters. Yeah. Yes, yes. So yeah, yeah. He's, he does yeah. a lot of Godzilla too. And he does yeah. Ultraman. Um, he's published with doing an Ultraman um, comic as well, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, I, I, I'm not. Okay. okay. I don't know his whole catalog. His fans <laughs> would know it better than I do. I just work, I work with him and he's a friend of mine. But um, yeah. his fans would probably not think I deserve to work with him if, if, given my lack of knowledge on the subject. So. <laughs> But, um, so, uh, so we're doing, so God Shard Chronicles, we have the video game, um, in development, but we're also doing a comic the manga series based on the video game and he's the artist. So, um, he's, we're doing Pensacon this weekend. Um, it's a big convention in this, in Pensacola, Florida. He's a guest there. Uh, we both, we both are going to have a table, um, uh, set, promoting our, his stuff and my books. And then next next week after the convention, we both I'm going to drive him all the way to Texas. We're meeting with the publisher to get this published. Um, uh, I don't want to say that. I mean, the publisher could just say no or maybe the I don't know. But uh, most likely it's going to be published and um, it's going to be a new comic series. So that's the next one. And then that's the video game. And I'll probably do one more God Shard Chronicles book as well. But um, I, I, it's. Yeah, that's why when we did the audio narration, I didn't give too much feedback. It's just because I'm swamped doing every other thing and I'm falling behind on each one of them. So, so wow. I'm glad you well, picked the flag. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot. You got a lot going on. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Elman. Con- continued success. Where do we find more about you? Then uh, you got a website. Um, I don't do so much the author name because I, I'd like people just to enjoy the world. I, I, I don't want people to look at my ugly face on, you know, when they go to websites. So I just do godshard.com. That's my website. Um, and I have Twitter. It's a uh, godshard RPG, um, same as Instagram. So I, I keep it more focused on, on my main series, on the video game series and the book series or the comic series. Um, god, godshard.com. That's godshard.com. G-O-D-S-H-A-R-D. As simple as that. Yeah. Great. I'll put a link. If you, I mean, it's easy to remember, but just in case you can't, I'll put a link to that in the description as well on YouTube. Elman Dean Todd, pleasure working with you and lovely to finally talk to you. Thank you very much. No worries. And um, I'll have to get you on. If I do any sequels, I'll have to get you definitely on the, for uh, if we return to Ivor's little adventures, we'll have to get you on those too. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. It's so much fun. Such great characters. Yeah. And I won't put the price up. I'll keep it exactly where it is at extortion. I won't move it any higher than that. I promise. (laughs) Cheers, man.